Good afternoon and good morning again, everyone. My name is Shane Hampshire. I will be your technical host for today's webinar. We're going to get started here in just a few moments, but I want to make sure that you all have uh, the information necessary uh, to have a great experience. Uh, over on the left-hand side of your screen, you will see a uh, Q&A pod. Uh, that's where you can uh, ask questions, provide comments, uh, either for our presenters in today's presentation, or uh, if you need any kind of technical assistance, you can ask those there as well. In the middle of your screen is where you will see uh, the presentation for today. And in the left-hand part of your screen, as we move to the next stage, you will see a live captioning pod. So uh, further ado, we'd like to hand it off to our moderators today to start today's event. Hello? I uh, think, Siri, if you want to start whenever you're ready, please go right ahead. Thanks, everyone, for your patience. We're just trying to manage a technical um, situation to make sure we can hear our presenters. So thanks for hanging with us, and um, we will get this moving in sh very shortly. Sorry about that, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Siri Schumann, and I'll be hosting our webinar today on face-related dementia programs. Our webinar is hosted by the National Alzheimer's and Dementia Resource Center, which consists of our team at RTI International. The purpose of the webinar is to provide helpful, current, and applicable information for ADSSP and ADI SSS grant projects and others in the aging network. Please note the webinar today is being recorded and will be available at the website nadrc.acl.gov within a few weeks. We will allow time for questions through the webinar's chat feature at the conclusion of the presentation. If you have a question during or after the presentation, please enter those questions into the chat feature of the webinar. At this time, I'll turn it over to Erin Long from the Administration on Aging, Administration for Community Living, to provide a brief welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us for this very important webinar. I want to thank Daphne and Patty for uh, taking their time to talk about the programs that they're implementing in their communities. I look very forward to hearing what they have to share and um, pass it back to you, Sari. Great. Thanks so much. So today we will hear from Patty Mouton and Daphne Johnston about their faith-related dementia program. Patty Mouton has served as the Vice President of Outreach and Advocacy for Alzheimer's Orange County since 2005. She manages clinical outreach and education for physicians, nurses, social workers, and other healthcare providers, as well as the advocacy and public policy activities at the local, state, and federal levels. 
Daphne Johnston has been involved in senior administration for 15 years and currently leads the respite ministry in Montgomery, Alabama. The respite ministry serves over 200 people with Alzheimer's disease and dementia and includes 120 dementia-trained volunteers from eight churches and two synagogues. Ms. Johnson's volunteer model of care has drawn the attention of the University of Alabama School of Medicine as they work to partner with other volunteer programs around the Southeast United States. We'll begin with Patty Mouton's presentation, so I will turn it over to Patty. Well, good morning and good afternoon. This is so exciting to be, to be part of this group. I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, a specific program at Alzheimer's Orange County. We have a robust interfaith outreach um, program that um, focuses on providing religious services that are uniquely tailored to individuals with cognitive impairment. So it was conceptualized about 16 years ago um, by our former CEO. And what we looked at was the fact that people in the community who are living in an assisted living building or a board and care or even a skilled nursing facility weren't able to get out necessarily to religious services in their own house of worship. It was either too arduous to get them there Sometimes the services were too long or too involved. There were behaviors or it just wasn't conducive to having people with dementia or some other cognitive impairment attend. So we put together a volunteer advisory study group and a committee to look at what could we do to answer this unmet need. And they determined then that they would attempt to have three um, pillars in the program and have one service in some house of worship throughout Orange County every month that they would engage the community to participate and have this be um, also a platform for education about dementia and that the program would have to be really driven by volunteers and liaisons at the individual houses of worship. The benefits of spiritual care, especially for older adults who are suffering from, with dementia, are well documented in the literature. Um, we, we know this from an evidence-based perspective and also anecdotally. And if you've ever watched someone who has dementia, um, be it Alzheimer's or Lewy body or any of the dementias, if you've seen them respond at a religious service, there's just no question that they're receiving some benefit. And um, some of the stories that we have um, through the past 16 years are so heartwarming and inspiring and sometimes really amusing. One was a gentleman who kept trying to leave the church in the midst of the presentation, like he was looking for something and he was just really intent um, on, on getting outside. So one of the staff members just let him go outside and went with him and walked around with him on the church grounds. And finally she said, you know, where, where are we going? What is it that we're trying to do out here? And he said, you know, I'm just searching for something. And he looked at her and he looked deep in her eyes and he said, are you the Lord God? And she said, well, no, I'm not, but I think I know where we might be able to get a little closer to finding him. And the gentleman just came right back into the, into the church and was fine and um, you know, really enjoyed the rest of the service. And then after another service, uh, sometime later, one of our volunteers was in an assisted living that had recently brought many of their residents to a service. And a gentleman was kind of walking around, and he happened to walk into one of the administrative offices. And he looked up at her, and he said, oh, I know you. And she said, well, why, yes, you were just with us over at, um, at the Presbyterian Church this week. And he says, yes, they gave me a mug, and they made me feel like myself. Good. So we can see just in practice and in vivo that this works. And it really helps to bring up people's self-esteem and care for them as total individuals. We all approach this from the fact that we are more than just who we are. We're more than just who we know and what we know or what we can say or what we can remember. We're spiritual beings who happen to be having a human experience. And this really facilitates it. 
I included this slide. It's a reprint from an article in Newsweek probably seven or eight years ago, and it's used with permission. And it really just um, underscores the fact that the literature really supports that spiritual experiences, spiritual participation are good for us as human beings. Regardless of what you believe, we know we can map out that when people are participating in this fashion, they're getting some positive response. And these are the areas of the brain that are particularly impacted when people are engaged in religious or spiritual um, kinds of um, activities. So if this is going to be successful, it takes a commitment. It's not the kind of thing you can just try out because houses of worship and volunteers need to be supported, need to be heard, need to have true bedrock equity in the process. And from my perspective, having um, been engaged with this program um, directly as a staff member for about 11 years and for several years prior to that as a volunteer. And then for the last two years, it's been part of my department's responsibility. Unless you're in it for at least a two or three year commitment to really give it everything you've got to see if you can make it successful, then don't do it because it's just too much engagement and equity and emotional investment of all the people involved. You want to have a very, very robust planning committee from all denominations so that people feel like they get to um, construct this from a foundational level. You want to budget for adequate staff time. Over the years, we have come to realize it takes a minimum of eight hours a week of staff time over the course of the year amortized um, in order to have this really be successful. You can't do it with only volunteer support. And you have to have the right staff member. That person has to be able to not only engage with volunteers, but with all the staff and volunteers from the various houses of worship. So you have to find somebody who is homogenized enough in their own spirituality that they're not going to offend anybody and they're going to be able to get along with everyone and kind of operate in the space that um, can be very diverse. We usually put on one service a month. Any more than that, and we have tried it where we've done two services a month, it's pretty taxing on the volunteers. Each service attracts between 40 to 75 guests, although for about six of our services this past calendar year, we've had more than that, especially the Christmas service. That's usually 100 or more. And we do special, special seasonal things. <coughs> Excuse me. So at Christmas time, we have the preschool carolers from the school attached to that church come and sing at the service. Or we have an elf um, who participates at the luncheon or a Santa Claus. So whatever is happening liturgically, seasonally, we include that in the service for our participants. Um, you have to pay really close attention. Who's going to call whom? Lists are important. Who's going to get confirmation from the right individuals at the assisted living building? Who's confirming the attendance? Because if you're asking your church ladies at the various congregations to organize a little luncheon gathering after the service, you want to be sure you don't have a lot of leftover chicken salad sandwiches. Um, that demoralizes people who are putting in a lot of volunteer hours and they're uh, spending some of their budget on this. You want to make sure that the shuttles coming from the assisted living buildings or the skilled nursing facilities, that there's a really good place for them to pull up and discharge the passengers safely with a lot of escorts. Where do they park afterwards? Is there plenty of parking for them or do they have instructions? Um, you have to be sure that you've got a place to store all the walkers and wheelchairs because, let's face it, a lot of the participants and guests coming are going to need assistive devices. Restrooms, are they easy to get to? You might have to defer a certain house of worship if their restroom facilities are not adequate to, um, to take care of the guests that are, you know are going to be coming. And then not only do you have to have a really well-trained and engaged core of volunteers from your organization, 
you have to have good volunteer support at the house of worship and people who understand dementia, people who are not going to be put off or embarrassed or um, unsure of what's going on when somebody has some kind of an episode. So I've included a lot of photographs just so you can um, kind of get a visual of, of what we have to arrange. There's usually a whole um, core of wheelchairs and walkers and so forth. Um, and you want the services to be very short, very adapted for the people who are the primary guests. No more than about 20 minutes long. Everything is short and sweet. You want to provide lots of cueing. Um, so even for prayers that are very, very familiar to most people attending, you want to make sure they're right there in front of them so that they can participate and they don't feel lost in the shuffle. When we do hymns, um, familiar hymns, old time hymns, first verse only is a good rule of thumb. Um, make sure that the scriptures are the familiar versions. So, you know, many of the contemporary churches have gone to um, more contemporary kinds of translations. For this group, maybe you want to go back to the old-fashioned King James Version or the Douay Version in the Catholic churches, something that's going to resonate as very familiar language. Make sure the church allows plenty of time so that they don't have a wedding or another service planned directly afterwards. This takes a lot of time. Even if this service is only 20 minutes, it might take you 30 minutes to get everybody out of the church. Uh, the minister needs to be prepped and really supported and given um, perhaps um, a, a little handbook we have put together for our pastors that participate so that they've got something to go on and they're not um, surprised that their sermon or their message really doesn't resonate with older adults. Um, you want them to be really prepared for whatever might happen with this population. So no fire and brimstone, no altar calls, no conversions. This is not about salvation. The salvation is coming in the fact that everybody is having a lovely religious experience. You want to publish the calendar well in advance so that the assisted living buildings can put this on their calendars and plan for it. Um, and that's why you want them involved in the planning process as you start out, because if you're planning to do this on Wednesdays, because it works for many of the churches, but that's doctor appointment day in the assisted living, then you're not going to get the participation that you seek. Our county is very diverse ge geographically. We have 34 municipalities. Even though you can drive across the entire county in an hour's time, it's a very, very uh, geocentric mindset. So if somebody lives in North Orange County, for example, in North Fullerton, they will never bring their residents all the way to San Clemente in the south end of the county. So you have to spread it all out and make sure that people understand why you're going to do one in San Clemente and not do everything in Central County. Um, you want to be ecumenically diverse so that it's not always in a Catholic or a Lutheran church. You want to sprinkle it around. And that helps if you have a, a really diverse uh, planning co committee to get things started. Um, we, we're in practically every denomination imaginable, um, including Buddhist, including Islamic. We, just, um, we really try to be as diverse as possible. It's phone-centric work. You have to call people, and then you have to call them, and then you have to call them again. It's not something where you can send an email and expect action. It's very personal connection. And it really helps if you have someone at the house of worship who's your champion in this. And it's going to help coordinate all the details. Another really important point is the staff, the line working staff at the assisted living, have to really buy in. This is not something that the administrator gets involved in or the director of nurses. Even the director of activities, that's important. But you want to be sure that the drivers and the CNAs or assistants who care for the people who are going to be the ones on the shuttle bus going to the services, you want to be sure they're engaged in this. Um, and then the clergy. The clergy has to feel really supportive and successful and um, to know what to expect. 
Then promotion. No matter how many times you publish the calendar, you have to do individual flyers and announcements for each monthly service, and you have to send it out a lot. U.S. mail, social media, email, a phone call. You have it at health fairs around the area. You put it in the, you ask the churches to put it in their bulletins. Um, you might stop and make some calls at the, at the churches surrounding where you're going to have the service. This is an exercise in chronic over-communication all the time. Because your volunteers are really driving the process, you really want to work on recognizing them, have a very diverse group, but have regular meetings, monthly meetings, and then we have a quarterly, uh, more formalized advisory committee meeting. And we give them presents. We take really cute pictures of them at different services, and then um, we, we frame them and give them to them, or we do some other nominal kind of gift just so they feel appreciated. Um, and this is a, a picture of some of our core volunteers. They're wonderful people, very dedicated, um, but just like anything else, they need to be recognized. We try to get to as many different denominations as possible. So we have Catholic, we have Lutheran, Presbyterian, um, the Jewish synagogue, um, you name it, we've probably done something there, Episcopal. Presbyterian, so we really try to be as diverse as possible. We have several synagogues that participate with us regularly. Um, we get people involved. Um, that adorable small child happens to be my granddaughter, but um, when we serve the little lunch afterwards, we want to be sure everybody gets involved and feels um, really good about the process. So um, the, the guests that are coming, the participants, really enjoy seeing children engaged. Here's a picture of a Buddhist church where we had a service. Here's a Catholic church. So um, I just wanted to include a lot of photographs so you could really get a visual. This is a group of one of the church ladies who, who prepare the lunch for everybody. They're the mainstay of these programs. They serve a little lunch afterwards so people have fellowship. And, um, and you know, these, these are the people that actually make it happen. And I love this photograph because of all the little gray heads. Um, be careful when you're taking pictures that they're not terribly identifiable because we want to be sensitive to any HIPAA constraints. Um, you want to entice the assisted living. So whenever they come and bring their people, we take pictures of the bus with their marketing information, and then this gets blasted all over social media with big thank yous so that they get extra ink for participating. And then once a year, we go around to the major assisted livings that have participated, and the driver of the shuttle, the activities assistant, the caregivers, who participate actively in the program, they get a, a certificate of recognition, and they get special cookies or a cake, something. It's very low cost. It's a little time and labor intensive, but it ends up having them feel very much appreciated for what they do. Um, I took this project on because I was inspired to do something that would help me remember the people in my life that would have benefited had they lived long enough to see it. So this photograph is a picture of my father who's been deceased um, well over 10 years. And um, I just always know he would have been, of all the things I've done in my entire professional career, this is the program of which he would have been most proud. So I keep this um, handy so that I can really see. And then we'll end with one of my favorite churches, Trinity Presbyterian. Um, and, and it just gives you a real feeling for how these folks enjoy the process and what kind of inspiration it provides for the people who are experiencing dementia. And um, that feeling stays with them, sometimes for several days. So thank you for your interest in the program. Our program continues to grow. And um, we hope to have it double in participation and size over the next two-year period. Thank you so much, Patty, for your presentation. That was great. 
Uh, at this time, we will turn it over to Daphne Johnson, who will talk about her program, The Respite Ministry. Thank you. Um, thank you, Patty, for that presentation. That was so inspiring. We, we are based out of a Methodist church and have tried to do several dementia services, so I know the work that you've put into that. That's great. The respite ministry is a, a little bit different than what we've just talked about. We are a day program that goes Monday through Thursday from 10 o'clock to 2 o'clock. And the main difference in respite and any other thing I know of is that we have no paid staff. This is a complete day program that is based off 120 volunteers with close to 15 uh, volunteers coming a day and one paid director. Um, so we think it's pretty special because we've involved the community. But looking at this first slide, it developed out of our uh, Committee on Health and Welfare, and our minister really saw a need for those living with dementia and asked me to come up with a project of what, how we could serve them. And I found a program in Atlanta, Georgia, that the lady had started a day program based on volunteers, and I went up and saw it and brought it back to Montgomery. Um, we started with two participants and 14 trained volunteers. We didn't have a video at that time, and nobody could understand how happy this ministry can be. We laugh all the time. We have early uh, to moderate um, people living with memory loss from any range of vascular to Parkinson's to Alzheimer's. But anyway, we started with that small crowd, and it slowly built up. Um, the theory behind what we do we, uh, we adopted Dr. Alan Powers' book, um, Dementia Beyond Drugs, and he really has been a leader for me. He talks about how society has built ramps and access and accommodations and all these things for people with physical disabilities. But what have we done for those that have memory loss? I mean, what, what have we done other than say, you know, you need to go home and rest and get your affairs in order and respite just blows that up. We want people to be vital, and we want them to know that they're missed and to have purpose and meaning again. And we think on the volunteer model, that, that best serves our, our population. Um, just looking at the slide, it's a sense of well-being of participants when it's with the care partners, the family, the volunteers. Um, we're all mixed together, and, and nobody knows the difference in the, in the whole program. We, we all wear the same name tags. Um, we just build self-esteem throughout the day. All of our volunteers in our training are trained to say, well, thanks, George. Thanks for helping me with uh, the new guy. He doesn't have a lot of family in town. We really appreciate your help. We appreciate you, how you've helped serve lunch. We appreciate what you've done to help get ready for the next activity. All through the day, we're saying thank you, thank you, thank you, because how many times do our friends with dementia hear the word thank you and that you're needed and you're appreciated. So we've built up the sense of connection and security and just like in this slide, um, Dr. Power identifies the ramps to well-being that we like to use, identity, connection, security, autonomy, meaning, growth, and joy. And all of those things you, you just can't get at home with a care partner who's strung out and stressed out. So we want to you know, provide that community for people. A typical day at respite is four hours. Um, just for a little background, we started two days a week with a small number of volunteers, and then we slowly grew. So now we're at four days a week. But we arrive, and we do puzzles and coffee and have a little breakfast. And then we uh, move over to a 30-minute either yoga or weights class. And then we move into music, art, or hand-eye coordination. You know, we play a lot of games or we do activities, but everything that we do is based on relationships. It's, there's just a difference to me in having 20 people with Alzheimer's and three or four staff members as opposed to 10 or 15 retired teachers, doctors, lawyers, um, nurses. We have captured the energy in the community to put back into our participants. So that's, that's what's so exciting is the, is the relationships. It's not just the activity. And then we move on to a hot lunch so the caregiver doesn't have to uh, provide that. And more activities after lunch. Um, and then we always end on music. 
So it's a full day, and they are exhausted by the end of the day. They're happy. Um, in the four and a half years that we've been here, we've had no elopements. Uh, I think I think people have a hard time imagining that volunteers can be responsible in a program like this, and we just give them a lot of ownership throughout the day, and the volunteers really um, take a lot of pride in what they do. The elements of respite um, were open to everyone, as I said earlier, 10 to 15 volunteers a day. And, you know, I need you all to know, there's sometimes that I have to cut back the number of volunteers that have signed up because we're out of space. Once these volunteers get into the program, they're so addicted and they want to be there. They just lose themselves. I had one volunteer say yesterday, it's like I'm immersing myself in humility. And I think that really captures how we all feel. Um, they, they love it. And I don't know of another program that, that does things like that. But anyway, moving on to uh, what our participants need to be able to be in the program. They need to be uh, mobile. And we have walkers and wheelchairs. That's not a problem. But they need to be able to, to move on their own, um, handle their restroom needs, and really, truly just to be able to be in a group setting. Because on a typical day, there's 20 to 35 people in the room, and it can be overwhelming um, to some. There is a cost for our ministry. It's $30 a day from 10 to 2, and we always tell families it's um, from you know, a little over $7 an hour for the best care and the best medicine you can get. And we have never turned anyone away from the program. We are roughly right now operating with about 30% of our population on scholarship. Here's a picture of just the group for the day. Um, all the things that we do, we really take on a classroom atmosphere because I've got tons of retired professionals that just enjoy the fact that they're still learning and that they're in a classroom atmosphere and that they've not been forgotten and that they still can grow and still learn. So we do a lot of whiteboard exercises, a lot of group discussions. Um, here this is Wheel of Fortune, and they love to see men be Vanna White in the sequin jackets. But you know, here again, this looks simple, but this is 30 people participating in, in the rhythm of, of being in a group. And you know, they can participate if they want to, but um, they're always set up for success. And it's the volunteers that set them up for success. So that's what makes it so neat. Um, we love some dart guns and shooting Coke cans down. But the cool thing about this is even though we're doing these activities, all the volunteers are doing the activities. So you've got me, the 39-year-old, bossing around all these people. But we've got 35 people doing the same activity. So we're all the same. And even if you know we use a dart gun, um, there's, there's no pressure because everyone in the room is doing the same thing. The benefits of respite, just, they just can't fit on one slide, so I apologize. But um, for the care partners and the participants, um, we see these families come in so broken, so alone in the dark. I know you all have seen them mentally, physically, emotionally exhausted, and just bankrupt. Um, Respite just wants to step in and, and truly with just a sense of purpose, meaning, well-being, all of that can be alleviated for the most part. And when we improve their quality of life, um, it improves for the extended family too, the daughters, the sons, the spouses, or whom, whomever that can't get back to be here. They know that their parent is being loved or their spouse. It's, um, it just meets an immediate need for the whole family. Uh, the volunteers, I just can't say enough, and I think that's why we've, we've gotten um, some recognition over the past couple of months. The volunteer is what makes the difference. And, you know, you can't ask a care partner to set up an activity at home, do the painting, be expected to know what they're doing in the art, or be expected to know how to sing a choir book, and then clean it up and get the person ready for the next event. It takes a team of people. And I've seen those assisted livings where it's hard when you've only got two staff members and an activity director. But here, you've got 15 trained people that are just willing to go above and beyond. And, and that's truly what makes the difference. It's the seamless flow throughout the day of the volunteers. Um, moving on. 
church and the organization. I loved how Patty was talking about all the different uh, religions that are involved in her program, and we do the same thing. We're, we're the Methodist church, but I think in our program we have got Buddhist, Catholic, Presbyterian, Judish, Jewish uh, families, um, Methodist. We are receiving scholarship funds from four separate churches now and the synagogue, and we have pushed and pushed to make this an open community project for the whole city and for the region. And to my knowledge, in our city, we, we don't have another project where people serve together. Uh, people have donated and written checks, and they might support tutoring, or they might support, um, I don't know, just different things in the community. But when you can really come and serve and work four hours together with your neighbors, because to me, a lot of people want to help with Alzheimer's. They've just not been given the outlet. And with training and with trust and ownership in the program, they all really want to participate. Um, I don't know if I've captured this in a slide, but uh, we have recently started our program in four different cities and in five programs. A Jewish services organization picked up our program. Four other large Methodist churches have picked up our program. And now UAB School of Medicine, which is our only big neurology department in the state, they've seen how all these patients have gotten better. And they want to partner with us to form a coalition to take this all over the state and all over the southeast. So we're really proud of that partnership. And it's really educating physicians and nurse practitioners on, you know, they don't, they don't need drugs all the time. They really just need to be needed and be a part of a group and um, have a little bit of purpose. The, the main thing in these next few pitch, pictures I've got, you just can't tell the difference from the volunteer and the participant. There's no different color smock. There's no different name tag. There's, no, there's just no difference. We're all there together serving each other. This is just a slide I thought you all would enjoy to see um, what all it takes for the volunteers. One of the biggest hooks to get volunteers in my program is to say that you don't have to commit to every Monday. and You don't have to commit to every other Monday. You don't have to get your replacement. You don't even have to commit to a season. Guys, you would just be amazed at when you give somebody some flexibility, um, they all want to participate. And then when they do, they all want to come back. And so that's where I pick up those 10 to 15 volunteers a day because I have such a large pool that when people don't feel like they're just stressed out and have to be there every Monday, they, they want to be a part of it even more, and they know that it's, it's very flexible. So we've never been sure today, the four and a half years we've been in operation. Um, that's a key ingredient. Uh, the logistics parts of the day, I think I've already covered the $30 a day. Uh, we roughly have been given over $400,000 in the past four years without even asking. I mean, it's the community that has seen the difference. They want to make sure I have plenty of scholarship funds. And when I'm talking to families, I don't ever say that, you know, we have scholarships. I don't want them to feel like they're having to take a handout. We always just say, you know, we've been blessed with a lot of resources, and we just want you to come to the program. Just, just come. So much of it is care partner education and making it okay for these retired professionals to come out of their house and, and be a part of a group. So. We do a lot of education in the community. Here are just a couple of samples of our art that we do. Um, all of our participants typically have never done art. And all the volunteers are trained to come down. And, and we just begin the sessions by saying we're working on a project. And we either work for on a project for shut-ins, or for people in a nursing home, or for a sick person that's in our group. When people know that they're doing something for another person, it just makes them a lot more apt to do it. And they take pride in what they're doing. And when we put it all together to, to make a poster or to make flowers or to make whatever we're going to send, they, they truly have a lot of pride in what they do. I've just recently sent five people to Ohio. And I don't know if you all know about an um, art program called Opening Minds Through Art. But this lady in this program focuses on abstract art in dementia, and she uses teenagers as the volunteers. So we, we've been using our volunteers lately, but we've hired someone to take on the, the art part 
of recruiting, our goal was 80 students, either high school, high school or college, to do two art sessions with our friends. Um, abstract art just opens their mind to, to their choices. There's no right or wrong. It's not going to look silly. It's, it's truly just their choices in being in the moment. I include this slide because anybody interested, you know, this to me speaks volumes to a minister or a rabbi or whoever the service director is. Um, there is revenue that comes in from this ministry. And I did this by myself for three and a half years and paid for myself for three and a half years because we do have revenue coming in. And $30 is a lot for some, it's nothing for some, and somehow it all seemed to balance out. But this slide is, is just a good example of there is money coming in to pay for it. You have to remember that when you're in the church, you've got a free setting. There's no overhead because this is space that is not being used during the week. It's already being heated and cooled. People are really apt to help you um, with an all summers ministry. So you've just got a lot of free overhead if you can just raise the money to get a decent part-time director someone that can work with volunteers and work with the families. This is just a quick slide of setup costs, just part-time salary, a laptop, a phone, um, some of the supplies. The meals were my biggest headache at the beginning, trying to figure out how to get 15 or 20 meals to our program a day, but that all worked out. Um, and then our five programs that we've started across the state, they've, they've all found ways to do that as well. This is just a slide to go over some of the small, small things that you just need for the activities. And there again, so many of our activities are group discussions and creative ways to, to draw them out of their personality. So it doesn't take a whole lot of money. Um, I've listed 20 medical grade chairs because I just wanted us to be safe. But even, even the chairs, you, you can go a lot less expensive than that. And this, <coughs> excuse me, this is our pride and joy. This is our side-by-side -side choir that as the respite program, the day program developed, I was really looking for another step um, for the city that could, they could get involved in. And I heard about a program up in New York of the lady that started a caregiver, a care partner choir with a person with memory loss. I looked that up, and there's one in Minneapolis. But this is made for the care partner and the person because they don't have anything fun to do anymore other than go out to eat. When people don't understand their dementia, when people don't understand what they're living through, um, it's really difficult to find a meaningful activity. So we opened up this choir. I hired a part-time director and an accompanist, and we went from 15 to 20 people to 60 people in the choir. And now our local art museum has partnered with us for concerts at the end of each session. So it's really become a city um, treasure. And we just kind of rotate the different sponsors that help us with the church, uh, that help us with the day program. <coughs> this last slide is very wordy, and I have to apologize. But in the middle where it says, if we should forget God, God does not forget us. I think this whole ministry is based on God not forgetting us. And We've been very open to every religion, to atheists, to whomever has got this disease. We're open to everyone, and I, th I think God has blessed it, and I hope we can share the model uh, with other people. So thank you. <coughs> Thanks so much, Daphne, for your presentation, and again, thank you to Patty as well. Um, at this time, we will open our session for questions. As we talked about earlier, you can put your questions into the Q&A chat pod on the webinar, and we'll change our layout so you can um, see the question box a little bit larger. So as people are um, at getting their questions assembled here, I will um, ask the questions of whoever they're uh, directed to, and then, um, and then they will respond. So um, the first question, um, is for you, Patty, and that the the question has to do with the diversity of your participants. Can you talk a little bit about how you are um, reaching, you know, um, maybe African American churches or Latino groups uh, with your program? 
Sure. Um, first, I have to give a, a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, Orange County, California um, is very diverse, but the diversity of cultures is primarily for uh, Hispanic individuals and Vietnamese individuals in addition to Caucasians. We have the largest population of Vietnamese-speaking individuals outside of Saigon. We don't have a lot of African-American residents, so less than 3% of our population is African-American, and there's probably only four or five African-American um, specific churches in our entire county of maybe 1,400 churches. So we invite uh, um, the, um, the uh, AME church to participate but we haven't had a service there. It just hasn't been um, as compelling for them because their congregations um, are, are smaller than some of the other um, uh, flavors. We do have um, a service at least every other year in one of the major Buddhist churches for our Vietnamese population. And um, we uh, partner with several of the Catholic parishes that cater to both Hispanic and um, Vietnamese um, congregation. So when we are in those communities, then our outreach to advertise the um, service in that particular church um, goes out like a ripple effect. So we'll go to the Starbucks and put up a flyer, or we'll make sure that the nursing home that's a few blocks away from that church knows that we're going to be there, the community center, the support groups in that area that cater to family caregivers. So we do target kinds of advertising in order to um, do our best to engage the people that would be uh, impacted in that community. Great. Thanks so much. You know, a few questions have come in for you, Daphne, about how you train your volunteers at the respite ministry. Can you talk a little bit about the training that you provide? Sure. We, uh, we do a four-hour training. And at the very beginning, I, I had the 14 members of our church in that training. And during the four hours, I use a one-hour TIPA snow tape. She's an OT therapist um, based out of, I think, UNC or Duke. She goes all over the country. So we kind of hit the basics of dementia. And then I do about an hour worth of role play situations that could happen throughout the day. And then we go into um, more dementia education, but then also really the language that we use through the day. This truly is a social setting. We do not give meds. We have no nurse. We have no intake. This is a four-hour social get-together, and, and the volunteers are, are trained in that. So I do the volunteer training. And one of the most important things was to spread throughout the city so quickly. I asked the 14 members of our church, our first volunteers, to go and recruit one of their best friends to be a part of this ministry that was outside our church. So that quickly got us into eight different churches in both synagogues when, when the challenge was made to grow outside of our church. Great. Thanks, Daphne. Uh, Patty, a question for you uh, came in. To um, Can you explain a little bit about how you ensure that um, people of different religious faiths feel comfortable in the various settings that you have your um, services? Sure, and, and sometimes that does come up, especially um, the more significant um, someone's dementia and their social filters are a little less um, uh, pronounced. So we've had people come in and, um, for, for example, we had a gentleman who was a Jewish faith um, walk into a Catholic church and he'd say, oh, no, I can't be here. And so we just had staff or volunteers be with him and, and just engage him and say, you know, you could come in. It's really okay. It's going to be kind of short, and, um, and nobody's going to make you pray these prayers. We're just going to enjoy the music. And then he was fine. So um, that's part of the prep of the ministers so that they know they're going to have a very ecumenically diverse group of guests, and so their messaging has to be homogenized, if you will. Um, we're not trying to um, have anybody go to confession, or we're not trying to do an altar call for salvation. It's really just an opportunity for people to experience um, a, a feel-good religious spiritual 
setting that is familiar and probably will bring them back to their childhood or young adulthood. So all of the ministers who participate understand that um, we have to make this a little less denominationally specific and a little more welcoming and um, ecumenical. Great. Thanks, Patty. And Daphne, a few questions have come in about the respite ministry asking about um, if you need a, a license to run your program or if you get any state um, funding or area agency no. funding. That's a great question. We do not have to have a license because we're a social model. In the state of Alabama, this, this kind of ministry is so new that we don't fall under any of the state health regs for assisted livings or nursing homes or anything like that. That's how you can operate at such a minimal cost, I think. I think you can definitely start this ministry for under 50 or 40, 40 to $50,000 under, um, under that because you don't have the regs and you don't have paperwork and you don't, I mean, you have, I don't know, three to five pages of initial paperwork that they fill out, but there's just no assessments. There's no, I mean, it's just truly people helping people. So no, we do not have to have a license. I know in the state of Georgia, they have a congregational respite ministry and they have to do some paperwork. Um, but in South Carolina, I think, uh, there's a respite ministry sort of like us in Charleston, and they go from three hours, they go three hours and 55 minutes it's under the four hour limit of a social model for the state of South Carolina. I thought that was a good way to do that. Um, but we, we have no regulations, so you just have to check with your state. Great, thank you so much. So, um, Patty, can you talk a little bit about who designs the services each time that you have one? Does the clergy do that? Um, is there someone else that is um, designing the service? How sure. Does that work? Um, the the uh, pastor or minister at the respective congregation designs the service. So they choose the readings and they choose the music. But they've been given a handbook ahead of time, and they've been prepped a little bit so that they know um, the timing and, um, and so forth. But we give them that creative um, latitude to structure a service according to the liturgical season and according to what they want um, to, uh, to have as the scriptural readings and the music. So we, we have some, some great um, variations that come up. Um, and uh, uh, we give them that latitude. Great, thank you. So a, a question came in that could apply to both of you. Can you talk a little bit about any challenges you experienced when starting um, each of your programs? Daphne, we can start with you. Uh, I think I experienced, because I was going after the baby boomer volunteer, uh, we, we have a lot of 50, 60, 70 year old volunteers that have just retired and they're looking for meaning and purpose themselves and those are the people I wanted to harness. Yet, my youngest participant is 52 with frontal lobe uh, dementia and it was a little bit of a hurdle getting over the volunteers, seeing themselves. Um, a little bit, but it really wound up being a plus in the end because they could see themselves and, and they wanted to help more. So that was a little bit of a challenge before I could get a video and get slides and pictures put together. When I go out to do presentations, people can, can really just catch the spirit because when you say this is an Alzheimer's ministry, a day program, they, you know, it doesn't sound like it was going to be a lot of fun, but I, I promise this is the happiest place in the city. So it's really communication on, on what we do. Great, thanks. Patty, do you have any um, challenges that you want to talk about and maybe how you overcame them? Sure. Um, some of the biggest challenges we face is getting the assisted living um, communities to bring their people because it's a big job. Um, and you know they have to not only plan it, it has to not conflict with any other activities or 
on uh, appointments that happen at the assisted living. They have to make sure the shuttle is available that day. There has to be staff. So that's been our biggest hurdle. And there have been years when we've been disappointed that maybe only 15 or 20 people are brought from maybe one or two communities. So um, that's when we started doing um, particular recognition of the line staff at the assisted living buildings who are responsible for making it all happen. So the staff that ride the bus, the staff that uh, secure the shuttle, the drivers who drive the shuttle bus, um, we recognized them with the certificates and the um, cake or um, you know, special custom cookies. Um, and a ceremony so that they would know not only how much we appreciate it, but when people get thanked and recognized, then they're much more likely to want to continue to participate. So attendance has been the biggest thing. Occasionally, we have had situations where a church commits to have a um, service and something comes up and they can't um, fulfill their commitment. And then we have to kind of um, scramble to find a replacement um, venue. And that um, happens maybe once a year, something like that comes up. But we try and make lemonades out of a difficult situation. Um, last year, our Christmas uh, service church was in construction. And um, by about uh, November, they let us know, oh my goodness, they couldn't do it. And they were very um, sad and conciliatory. But we were able to get <coughs> excuse me, a church close by to step in and, um, and pinch hit for us. And what that did was then cause that new church that was pinch hitting to want to do this on an ongoing basis and have at least one service at their church every year. So it ended up helping us grow the program. Um, this year, we know now in August that our regularly scheduled Christmas church will still be in construction. So it has given us an opportunity to plan a special Christmas service and bring in several congregations to help us and really turn it into a major um, ecumenical and all community kind of event. So um, we just look at it like, OK, this is a glitch we didn't anticipate, but we'll find a way to make it work. And we don't cancel services. We have always found a way to make it work. Great, thank you. Well, we're about out of time. Patty, I did have a few people ask if they could, um, if you are able to share your handbook for clergy that you mentioned. Sure. Um, if, if they want to email me, then I can send them what I have. Sure, I'm happy to okay. do that. And for everyone, um, the contact information for the speakers today and uh, for me and um, Erin Long, who's at the Administration for Community Living, is in the closing notes underneath the questions. I did respond to all of you that have asked for the PowerPoint slides. Due to the um, number of photos in each of the presentations, they're a little too large to send via email. So as a reminder, the session was recorded and will be available at nadrc.acl.gov in a few weeks. I will type that into the closing notes as well. And at that location, you'll be able to view the presentation at any time so, and pass it on to others. So here is the uh, website where you'll be able to find it in a few weeks. So with that, I want to thank our presenters again for a wonderful program today. I think everyone learned a lot um, what great work you're both doing in your respective locations. So thank you so much for sharing with us. And all of you um, know how to get in touch with me if you have any further questions and if you um, are not able to jot down the emails of the presenters quickly. So thanks so much, everyone, for joining us. And have a lovely day. Thank you. Thank you.